Uh, before we introduce uh, our special guests, I want to take a moment to recognize today's signature sponsor, which is Cox, Cox Business. And please help me welcome Ahi Park, who's the sale manager for Cox, Cox Business, to the stage to say a few words. Ahi. Good afternoon. At Cox, we know that connections can change everything. We're excited for today's forum and the tremendous growth in startups in our city and state. We're proud to partner with many of the base camps from, for entrepreneurs like Star Space 46 and 36 Degrees North in Tulsa. Inside your program, there's a little information card about Cox Blue. I encourage you to visit this website. This site is packed with business news, information, and resources. Blue is about creating tangible value, an unparalleled user experience, long-term sustainability among all levels of businesses. The success of many startups and small businesses can often be traced back to a single meeting. We want to know where you made that connection that became a catalyst for the success of your startup and small business. Tell us your story, and if it is featured on Cox Blue, you'll receive $1,000 and a professionally produced video of your startup story. So please visit coxblue.com today. If you'd like more information about the products and services that Cox provides, please connect with me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also pleased to recognize our corporate sponsors. Those include ADG Incorporated and Guernsey. Please help me thank them for being corporate sponsors. So today's subject is entrepreneurship in our community and how Oklahoma City startups and the ecosystem in which they start up in is producing successful companies and innovative solutions to business and industry. Um, entrepreneurship is a real key component to our, the Chamber's, economic development strategy. And our community has uh, found itself very rich with resources for any type of company that wishes to call Oklahoma City home. Uh, from I2E to OCAST and to our colleges, our career techs, our universities, uh, there are really a variety of organizations, nonprofits, educational, government, private sector, offering business coaching and solutions for entrepreneurs. You're going to hear that today from three dynamic leaders who are involved in the startup community and who will give their perspective on how entrepreneurship is growing and thriving here and ways the rest of the business community like you can join in this momentum. For right now, please enjoy your lunch, and we'll regroup shortly to introduce the speakers and continue the program. So enjoy lunch. Great. Uh, so we have a very impressive group, as I said earlier, uh, on stage today. You can find their full bios in your program. Um, but first, I'd like to welcome uh, Danny Mahoney, Maloney uh, up to the stage. Danny is the CEO and co-founder of Tailwind, which is an Oklahoma City-based technology company focused on helping brands worldwide achieve their marketing goals on Pinterest and Instagram. Danny, thank you. Next is Scott Meacham. Scott is president and CEO of I2E, a nationally recognized private not-for-profit focused on growing innovative small businesses in Oklahoma. And lastly, Tommy Yee. He serves as the co-founder of Starspace 46, the largest co-working facility in Oklahoma City serving the technology and entrepreneurship communities. So thank you all for taking your time to be with us today. So as the uh, moderator, I'm going to direct questions to these individuals and then if time permits, we're going to let y'all direct questions to them as well. So first question uh, that I want all of you to spend one minute on Give us your personal view of Oklahoma City's startup ecosystem. What does it look like? What's the climate here, starting with you? Sure. Um, and I guess by way of background, so I moved to Oklahoma City uh, from New York about five and a half years ago uh, or so, somewhere in that range. Um, and so I'm still reasonably new in town. Uh, but at the time, I heard a lot when I got here from folks in the tech community, a couple big themes, right? So one was, it felt like the, there was a community developing and it was growing, but uh, people weren't really coming together enough and they weren't sharing insights and advice and working together. Um, and, and that was something uh, that was just, you know, everyone I spoke to seemed to say that. 
Uh, and then the second big thing was about um, access to capital, access to resources to be able to get up and going, to build companies faster. Um, and I think in the last five and a half years, we've made remarkable progress on both fronts. Um, and I mean, the number of user groups and community events that are happening is just unbelievable. Um, most of the founders in town seem to know each other at this point. A lot of the employees at different tech companies seem to know each other. They're actively sharing advice with each other. Um, you know, I2E has done great stuff that I'm sure Scott will share uh, in, in terms of helping provide access to additional resources and other folks in town as well. So uh, it's been really promising just to see the rate of growth. Uh, I can't say I have hard numbers on it, but um, subjectively I can feel it day in and day out that there's just a lot of momentum built. Perfect. Scott? So I2E is celebrating its 20th year of working in the development of high growth companies in Oklahoma. Um, and particularly, we have offices in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Our largest presence is here in Oklahoma City. And, and I speak a lot, and I, I've talked a lot lately about how I feel that Oklahoma City in particular is in the era of the high growth entrepreneur right now. And that's because of the quality of deal that we're seeing in the deal flow. We, uh, you know, we're a company that started maybe investing in uh, coffee makers and exercise equipment. Now we're investing in companies like We Go Look and Tailwind, and, and in fact, this last the last six months of last year, we invested in ten deals, which was an all-time record for us, and all of those but one were Oklahoma City metro uh, area-based deals. So we're seeing more higher quality deal flow in the high growth space. And again, let me just stress, that's our space. And for us, high growth is, you can have an awesome business that can make a great living for you, your family, your kids, your kids' kids, but we're paying in a, in a bigger space where you're, you're gonna serve national and international markets, where you're maybe gonna take your company public someday or sell to you know, Facebook or Google or somebody like that. Um, I would say uh, startup companies are, are booming now. Uh, I, I remember when we first opened the OKC Coco about 10 years ago. Um, you can count on one hand the number of tech companies that were sort of in the community. Um, and and I, I even recall Robin Smith giving her first pitch for We Go Look at, at one of our events and to kind of see companies like We Go Look grow and, and companies like Tailwind and, and, and Osberg and Monsierge, I mean, there, there's a number of them that are successful and that, that has allowed um, kind of startup companies and entrepreneurs today to have people to look up to. And I think when they see those success stories, um, people want to follow success and, and, it, and it gives people the, the option to uh, actually the mindset to say, you know, I can remain here and start a high growth tech company here in Oklahoma, I don't have to move. And, and I think that's a really important uh, shift in mindset because um, that's really important in keeping and retaining talent here. It, 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 it feeds back into the startup ecosystem here in Oklahoma City. Um, and I think that's why um, you, know, you see places like, like us, you see 36 degrees north in Tulsa. Just in Oklahoma City alone, there's about five or six other co-working spaces that have popped up as well, all serving um, entrepreneurs and, and startup companies. And so I, I think that's just a testament of of the state of, of startup companies and, and the growth that we've seen just in the 10 years looking back. Uh, going a little bit further down that road, Scott, uh, maybe you and Tommy, this is in your bailiwick. What kind of tools can you share with us that are really available for the entrepreneur themselves to analyze the business position in the market or obtain competitive intelligence? What, what tools exist for that? Uh, so, and I can speak obviously more towards I2E, we, we make referrals to a lot of different places of, of things that come in the door of companies we can't help. Um, and there's, there's different um, small business development centers out there. I think Rose State has one. I think the Edmund Chamber runs one. Uh, there's the Inventors Assistance Program at OSU. There's all kinds of things like that. What we do is we created something called the Venture Assessment Program. And, and it was really designed for us and the entrepreneur to determine whether this idea made sense for both of us to pursue. And, and really it's about, is there, a, is there a, what we call a product market fit? Is there a market for your product? What is the likely competition out there and how are they likely to respond? Because I promise you, competition doesn't want you to succeed. And, and what is your initial path to market? And it's really this three week program 
where we sort of take this initial dive and say, does this make sense for us all to go forward? And that, that's what we use as our primary screening product. Now, every now and then we get a, a, an entrepreneur that's, you know, like Danny, and he gets what we call the golden ticket, where uh, <laughs> he's, we can see the validity of his deal, he's been there, done that, and, and he gets a pass. But, but typically, most of our deals go through the venture assessment program. He goes to the front of the line. Yeah, he, gets, he just gets a free pass. He's just used to that his whole life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'd say the biggest role that, that we play, um, is basically we're dot connectors. Um, you know, we, we bridge people to the resources that are available. I mean, certainly at, at Starspace, we, we have our own little ecosystem internally, but um, we also assess where they're at and, and who are the right partners that we can point them to. And, and you know, in some instances, it could be I2E. Um, or in some other instances, it could be someone internally at Starspace or um, a service provider that, that's linked with us that could help them grow. And so, you know, we, we offer um, things like fractional sort of services at Starspace. So if you're a new company and you maybe don't need a full-time CFO or a HR consultant, well, we can provide someone who can fill that role for you in a part-time sort of fractional sort of way, right? And it's a way to kind of support the entrepreneur so they can focus on what they're best at and, and let these service providers also um, be able to support their businesses by providing you the services that, that you may not want to focus on or, or need full time. Um, and so I think, you know, for us, that, that's ultimately our, uh, where we play is, is to be able to point people um, to the best resources that are available in the state um, um, to help um, entrepreneurs achieve success. Uh, Danny, being an entrepreneur yourself, it, it, we know what resources we have here, mm -hmm. but what are some of the things that might still be missing in, in the arsenal that entrepreneurs really have to overcome in, in Oklahoma City? Sure, I think, um, <clears throat> I think it depends on what stage you're at. So uh, for a company like ours, we've entered into you know, growth phase and we're growing quickly. And you know, with that, I guess sort of like any other company, you know, what are the things you need? You need um, access to high quality, talented folks who want to join the team and who want to come and contribute. Um, you need access to capital to be able to grow as rapidly as you could or, or want to. Um, and you know, I think there are solutions to that. I mean, we're making progress day to day, but um, obviously the more we grow our community, the faster it grows, the easier those things are gonna become. Um, and you know, that said, I, I don't really feel like they're actually constraints for us right now. I mean, we've been able to fill every role we've wanted to hire in the last you know, year um, we've been, been able to have the access to the capital that we need. I think the question is, um, if there was a step function change there um, in what was available, would people actually build companies differently? And then uh, similarly, I would ask, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? So if, if companies start getting too much capital infused into them, uh, sometimes that leads to negative consequences. So we had a, a competitor early on out in the valley. They raised $14 million in 18 months. And 18 months later, they had burned through all of it too soon ahead of the market and were basically looking for a fire sale on their assets, right? Um, so you definitely hear a lot of those stories uh, happening around the country. And, um, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword, I guess. But it, it opens up the options. You still got to spend it wisely. You still got to build teams wisely as well. Well, speaking of capital, and Scott, I'm going to direct this to you. capital from our market? and not just, mark, not just capital coming in from elsewhere. And then also, how do entrepreneurs find that capital? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> and of course, that's always the, the biggest challenge for any entrepreneur is, is, you know, how do you get funded? And, um, you know, I think we have pretty good startup capital in, in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma in general. We, uh, and proof of concept capital, we have, of course, you know, we can only be half of the deal. So we're always pulling in. We have, we have a group of angel investors, over 50 statewide angel investors that will co-invest with us in our deals. We've actually started a private angel fund now that invest, and we're always trying to, you know, link in other people. I like having that local presence in a company in its early stages because they become very personally invested in it. Um, and I think you, you need a lot of love and support when you're starting to, a new company 
and, and, and you get more of that love and support from the local level. I think where our challenge is with companies like Danny that have kind of gone through proof of concept and are starting to scale, then you're having to get to a lot higher level of capital, and that's the capital that's more of a challenge in Oklahoma, and, and that's sort of our long-term problem we've got to work on is doing that, and I think that's sort of about how do we get a, an investor community that's used to and likes to write checks to oil and gas deals and real estate deals to now write them to a tech company that's, that's we've proven some market traction, but we got to scale. And I think that's, you know, that's the next big challenge that we have to overcome. Taking that a little further, Danny, mm -hmm. uh, when you are transitioning from startup to growth, mm -hmm. uh, what challenges do you see in this market in that? Scott's touched on some, but maybe you have a little uh, different perspective on on the availability of resources that are out there. Yeah, I think with tech companies especially, that growth can happen so incredibly rapidly. And sometimes I, I do talk to friends who are at companies out on the West Coast, for instance, and they're all like, oh, you know, we're still small. You know, we, we grew from 300 to 400 people last year, right? Uh, and to us, that sounds huge, right? I mean, there are only, you know, so many uh, local tech companies that have reached that kind of scale, and, and they're um, generally they've been around, you know, significantly longer. Um, but I think that's one of the, the interesting questions is getting to that point of scale, um, can you grow at that, at that pace, right? If we needed to scale up and triple the size of our team in a year, uh, obviously there are operational challenges there. There's a lot of muscles we would have to build internally in terms of um, recruiting and emplo employer branding and onboarding people at a much more rapid rate than we have in the past. Um, but there is a fair question there of, you know, are there enough people in the market looking for jobs with the right skill set that we can grow at that rate. Um, and the fact that we have a, a low unemployment rate doesn't exactly you know, help that situation, right? Um, Double H. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think longer term, it's, it, then it becomes a community-wide question of, okay, in order to solve that, how do we become a talent magnet to the point where from around the region, from around the country, folks are looking at OKC and saying, wow, it's not just one company here, it's a bunch of interesting companies that have sprouted up. I can go there. If it doesn't work out at this company, I still have a career. There are other places I can go work without having to move again. Um, you know, and there are some markets around the country who have, who have achieved that over time, like Austin and Boulder and Seattle. And so, yeah, you know, I think uh, figuring out as a community how we solve that and, and how we create a talent magnet here is, is really critical for long-term growth. This might be to all of you, um, you know, years ago, the buzzword was Wi-Fi, that the towns that, you know, were going to have Wi-Fi were going to be the magic solutions to, to everything. What kind of infrastructure, though, now do we need to have and is, is being looked at by entrepreneurs as being critical to not only startups but to growth? What, what kind of infrastructure makes us competitive now? You want to start your yeah, in the middle? I, you, you know, and I remember exactly what you're talking about when everybody's talking about Wi-Fi and connected cities and all that. And you know, the what we've seen in history is the rate of technological adoption is amazingly fast. I mean, if a new technology comes out, it, it just gets adopted like crazy. I mean, whether it's cell phones with you know 3G, 4G, LTE. I mean, it just it, it's it goes crazy. I what I really think is if you Sort of back to what Danny was saying. I think it's human capital. I think I think we've got to work on human capital, and I think it's 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 coders. I mean, I think you know, I, I, Tulsa's got this coding dojo thing going on that they're doing. I think I think we need more sort of co coding camps and coding nodes around. I think we need, you know, I write a lot in my column about uh, STEM and, and people following STEM careers, and you know, it's a little bit self-serving because I know those technical people. Are, are the people that will work for these companies and will create the ideas that move us forward. So, I, you know, that's where I would focus next. I think I, my focus would be on, on human capital and getting more, more people with the, the STEM kind of skills we need to fill these companies and move them forward. Because I think money follows good ideas and good people. And, and I think if we can do that, we can, and then I think I think that the sort of the tech infrastructure, it, it's going to—it's always going to be there because, guess what? If somebody jumps ahead of Cox, they're going to go out and spend a lot of money to be faster, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just—that's just how it works. I, I would echo.
Scott, actually. I, 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 I would say like the human infrastructure, the human relationships, uh, making sure that we have um, an ecosystem here that can provide what I think are sort of the, 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 the three sort of pillars of, of, of what keeps people in the city. Um, and you know, it's having great commerce and industry, having um, a, 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 a solid uh, foundation for education that supports industry, um, and then having enough culture that, that retains young talent here to, to want to remain here. And so if you have kind of a, a balance of all three, that's kind of typically when you look at all the great cities and, and, and um, how they're able to not only retain their talent, but attract talent. Those are kind of the three pillars that, that you normally see. Um, and so I think, you know, what, you know, I think what we could work on is, is really, you know, focus on providing the, those three sort of pillars to, to keep young people here, tell the stories of the Tailwind so that people, I'm, I'm surprised the number of young people who haven't heard of Tailwind or, you know, all these companies. And the moment you tell them about it, like, I had no idea those companies existed here. You know, they, they have this mindset that they have to leave the state to work for great companies that are in the tech space. Um, so really doing a better job of, of telling those stories. Um, and then just really, you know, working on getting um, um, young people to, to remain here. You know, I, I have a hypothesis that, that where uh, um, it's not until people are in their mid-30s where people start caring about PTA meetings and, you know, voting on city issues. So how do, how do we get people here and, and keep them here till, till they, get, they, they get to that magic age where they care about those things. Because once they start caring about those things, you have them, like they're not leaving, like this is home for them now, right? And so that's always been a, a, a thing that we sort of looked at and, 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 and tried to find ways how we participate in solving that problem um, um, from, from you know, our, our end at Starspace. Yeah. Get, get young people to grow up quicker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to add in on the education point. I mean, we do get that question a lot when we're talking to folks who are thinking about relocating from out of state. Um, a lot of the, the folks who do apply for roles with us are, you know, typically in that age demographic, late 20s, 30s, um, or, you know, 40s, where they have school age kids, they're thinking of having school age kids. And part of the reason sometimes they're looking to leave a New York or an LA or a Chicago is because they feel like this is a better place to raise a family. Um, and so the education topic comes up a lot and I think that's only compounded by the fact that people in the STEM industries tend to be highly educated, tend to value education a lot. Um, and so they're gonna value education a lot for their children as well. And so uh, education is a question we get frequently. We're not in charge of the weather. <laughs> uh, Scott, kind of going further down this line, you're, you're kind of a veteran of uh, 23rd and Lincoln. You've spent a little bit of your life there. Um, do, do we have issues in Oklahoma or opportunities, either one, uh, in the legislative environment that, that either hurts us in the entrepreneurial side of this or that helps us or that we could create that would help us even more? Well, you know, the problem is perception becomes reality. And, and, you know, if you go back to sort of the pre-thunder, you know, oil bus days of Oklahoma, the world viewed us as, you know, not very well, not to a very good lens. And that sort of, I always say, magically changed when the thunder came and we had the MAPS projects and we reinvented ourselves. Well, unfortunately, we're starting to send bad stories out again, and we're starting to see bad stories in, in national publications, and people see those. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, you know, I don't remember what it was, a state of despair or whatever, you know, those kinds of things, and, and you talk about, you know, there's bad stories about, you know, four-day schools can only afford to put on four-day classes. Well, guess what? His employee that he's trying to bring in is reading those stories and doing their due diligence and seeing that kind of stuff. So one of the best things we could do is just kind of eliminate those bad stories. The other thing is the state has literally disinvested in job creation over the past 10 years. Um, you know, the, our commerce departments had their budget cut over 38%. OCAST has had their budget cut over 38%, which means 
our contract has been cut over 38 percent which means we just do less i mean you do less with less money and, and it's not like there's all this waste right i i mean i parked my learjet a long time ago and walked away from it uh, you know it's it's just you just have you just have less people and you do less stuff and so i think there if our state could kind of address the pr issue and then you know just kind of start putting some money back in put you know they had this great had this great resource called the edge research endowment and it filled this great gap that was in our state and it was these tactical allocations and capital of deals and I, I mean i still got a couple of companies in our portfolio that are there because of that edge funding and so we i think there's a lot of things we could do um you know how we get there and whether we get there that's probably a lot longer discussion than we have today <laughs> Any comments you guys want to make about that? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think there is, you know, people do do their due diligence and, and, and read um, some of the bad press that, that comes out from the state. But I, I think Oklahomans can do a better job um, being a loud, louder mega, megaphone in terms of all the good things about the state. Um, you know, I, I travel a lot and, and um, you know, I'll fly out to Seattle or, or San Francisco and, um, you know, I tell them I'm from Oklahoma, and, and uh, they uh, immediately have this image in their mind of what Oklahoma is. But then the more and more I talk about all the great things here, they're like, wow, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd almost want to move there. Um, and, I, 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 you know, and, and, and it's the same thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of Creative Oklahoma, and, and so we, we do these international sort of reverse missions, and so, you know, I'm in Europe a lot as well and and you know when we talk about oklahoma to them you know to them oklahoma is this magical wonderland of opportunity and and so i i think um whenever you talk to people internationally or even people who have moved here from the east coast or west coast i, I think the one thing that they'll tell you is that we are oftentimes our own worst enemy and that we're often apologetic about all the bad things instead of saying no here's actually all the good things. Here's the opportunity that Oklahoma City and Oklahoma presents to you. And, um, you know, I, I think that's echoed by a, a good friend and mentor of mine, Doug Sirocco. I mean, he, he, he's, he's the, you know, he kind of pointed out the fact that, you know, he's from Maine, he's from the East Coast, and, you know, he has more talking points about what's great about Oklahoma City than most people who are native from here. And, and I think that's part of the problem is, is we maybe have a, a, you know, kind of a small man complex about things, and we like to compare ourselves to Texas or these other cities or other states, and 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 really we just need to be our our own biggest advocates, um, and and I think that can help alleviate some of the problems with with only the negativity being broadcasted out instead of and, and none of the good good things that are happening in the state. Just an interesting recent anecdote along those lines. Uh, we just hired a, a very bright. Yeah, a student out of OU, um, yeah, exceptional computer science skills for coming right out of college. And I was talking with him one day, and he reiterated this point of, well, you know, the attitude on campus is all the best students move out. All the best students go, you know, to work for some big tech company somewhere. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, who, who did you think were the best students in your class? And he started naming people. And I was like, all right, where'd they go? Where'd they go? Where'd they go? Almost every single one of them found a job locally. Almost every one of them is working for a local <laughs> technology company, or they're working for larger companies that, are, that now have presences here. Um, but that soundbite hasn't changed yet, right? Because students come in, they start hearing it from their freshman year, it gets repeated and repeated. And so the more positives that we do speak about our community and to ourselves, the more it's going to break that echo chamber of, of some of the, the negative facts out there. And so. Um, the good news there is I think there's, you know, anecdotally, there's real progress there. there. There are very bright students who are choosing to stay, even though they probably could go elsewhere. They want to build a community. They want to contribute. Now we just got to change that, that sound bite a bit. But um, that's, that's doable. That's, you know, that's solvable. Don't need to be creating our own misinformation. Right. <laughs> um, we talked about early stage. We talked about the growth stage. Let's talk a little bit about the exit stage. Uh, for an entrepreneur getting started, putting together their business plan, investor pitches, et cetera, it, explain the importance of during that phase even talking about an exit strategy and, and what resources are available to help in that process. And that's for all of you, so whoever wants to start. 
your closest? Sure. Uh, I, might, I don't know if I'm going to make Scott cringe with this comment or not. <laughs> uh, I'm a firm believer that you don't start a company by thinking about the exit. I think if you want to build a, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if, if you want to build something, even God, yeah. Like <laughs> I think there's a, a pragmatism to that in both directions. So one is if you want to build something really meaningful, really lasting, that that impacts the world, impacts society, you can't constrain yourself with short-term thinking. I mean, you've got to manage in the short term. The business has to survive. The business has to grow and build an engine. But you've got to think in the long term, there is a very big mission that I'm out to accomplish. And I'm not going to go around shopping my company before I feel like I've accomplished that mission. There's a second pra practical piece to that, which is the minute you start shopping your company, your price plummets. Right? So even if you did want to sell, you should never be out there trying to sell unless you absolutely have to. Um, and so you know, there's, it's kind of a joke in Silicon Valley that you know, no one's ever going public, no one's ever trying to sell, yet acquisitions and IPOs happen all the time. Um, but, but I actually believe that. I, th I think you, you want, for me at least, I want to build something meaningful. I want to build something that lasts and that has an impact on the world. Um, and if I'm thinking about how do I exit in 18 months or 36 months or whatever, that's, you know, I'm, I'm taking my eye off the ball on the longer term goal. Cringe. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> I, I was thinking as I was listening to what he was saying, disagreeing with him. Um, <laughs> no, what I was thinking is it's a little bit of difference in perspective. And, and probably the difference in strategy and tactics, if you think about it. Because he's going to come in to see me, and I'm going to say, where are you headed? And, and he's going to say, well, I think I'm headed here. And I'm going to say, okay, but yeah, or maybe you ought to think about heading here. But we've got to have a, a goal or a, a destination in mind. Now, we both understand how you get there is probably going to change 100 different times at least. And, and there's going to be a lot of twists and turns. And, and yeah, we're gonna, but we're trying to build something that we think has value to somebody else. Either it's a, either it's a public market if we're gonna take it public, or it's an acquirer. So we're trying to build value over time. Yeah, we want it to be a big idea. And we're not, by the way, gonna go shop it. We want them to come, come to us and start, you know, say, hey, I wanna buy you, right? But we're thinking every day from an investor standpoint, and, and when we're advising him, keeping him focused at some level on that. But we want him doing that blocking and tackling every day. We want him doing all that and the things he was talking about. But I just think you can't lose sight of building value in your organization in the long run that an acquirer, either public or private or whatever, might have interest in. So I think we probably don't disagree that much. Um, I would say at the very beginning, I, I, I would, I would echo Danny for if you're a new startup, you know, you should really focus on what's your impact, how do you deliver more value and, and, and get revenue, right? It's very tactical. And, and, uh, uh, but I think once you get to the point where Danny maybe is at right now, and, and I kind of went through it just recently with, with the company that I'm a part of, um, then you, know, you have to kind of determine um, what's the right strategy to deliver your value in the best way. So is it, is it going public? Is it um, staying a mid-sized company, or, or is it taking on additional um, investment, right? And I think, um, you know, once you get to a point where you're at a crossroads and, and um, you want to grow and, and, and deliver value in a bigger way, I think that's when you should start thinking about those options and, and, and choose the right path forward. Because um, not, not every path is the best path. Obviously, it has drastic sort of ramifications in how you operate your business. And, and, and the direction that your business is going. Um, um, I, I think most startup companies in, in Oklahoma um, probably lends itself to more of a, a, an acquisition or um, mid-size model. Um, um, and, and so I think for, for at least what I've seen, th those are probably the easiest paths for, for Oklahoma companies. Um, you know, maybe we'll see more and more go public. Um, but I, I really think it's, for a startup company, it's maybe a little too early for them to really think about, do I want to go public or, or exit? But I think once you get to a point where you're starting to you know, think about series A, B, or C, then that might be the time where you think about what's the right path to, to, to maximize the value that I'm delivering. Okay. Thank you all for keeping it civil. <laughs> um, Tommy, you're kind of in the space business and that kind of stuff. I don't mean aerospace, but I mean space for entrepreneurs. Um, 
do what what kind of opportunities are there for uh, engagement by people meetings of entrepreneurs are there forums what kind of interactive opportunities exist in the marketplace um, yeah so I, I think there's a lot of great activity in Oklahoma City if you if you just know where to look for it um, um, and um, we certainly host a, a lot of those activities um, ourselves um, you know we have a great partnership with with Techlahoma who throws a lot of um, mostly technology centered um, type conferences and, and meetup groups. Um, I know OCAST and I2E has, has done several sort of forums and workshops uh, as well. And um, so I think there's a lot that's going on here and, and, and there's traveling sort of touring um, workshops and, and, and stuff that's going on uh, that enters the state. So I, you know, what we just try to build the bridges and, and, and provide the list of, of what's going on and the resources for, for our community internally. Um, and, you know, our, us as Star Space, you know, we, we often will look at, okay, what's missing in the city? What are the gaps? And if, and if there's not a provider of, of a type of, of forum or a meeting or a workshop or resource, um, that, you know, we often will kind of see those gaps and, and, and provide um, uh, a service or, or, or something to kind of fill that gap. And so that's kind of been, been our place in, in, in the ecosystem. Um, but otherwise, we do try to point people to existing resources that do exist. Scott, uh, observations you have on this? Yeah, so there's a million cups that goes on, and I guess they meet every week? Uh, every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Yeah. I have my people go. I don't actually go myself. Uh, and, and that's a great, I think, just way for the community to get together and, and to network. Um, you know, we used to do a lot of events. And again, and all those cuts that I talked about, a lot of those kinds of things are the things that go to the wayside. Right now, what we do is we do a big entrepreneurial summit in the, uh, in the fall. It's free. Uh, we, we invite anybody who wants to show up, plus uh, about you know, several hundred college students, because in the afternoon, they do programming that feeds into our Love's Cup Collegiate Business Plan and Pitch Competition. We bring in a nationally renowned speaker. We brought Karina Gumpta from, uh, she actually grew up in Shawnee, and she's on her third startup now. Um, this this last time so we do we we do what we can it's just that we we found that we're becoming increasingly resource locked because of of all the cuts and funding that that we've had but you know I, there's there's also the startup weekends I mean I think that's coming up pretty soon yeah we're, 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 we're hosting that in, yeah in that's April, yeah. I think we're sponsoring that <laughs> and uh, we can't pay for it but we can help pay a little bit of the cost of it <laughs> Uh, so there, there are things like that that are available for uh, people in the community. Danny, from your perspective, do you see things you like to go to or see groups and places that yeah. what's your appetite? To? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there's uh, not only the ones that exist today, there are new ones starting up all the time. So um, one guy I met recently, um, he's starting up a product manager meetup here in town, and I was actually shocked to find out there wasn't one yet. That's awesome. Uh, that's a whole new community, a whole new skill set that can come together. Uh, my problem is I find more events I want to go to than I actually can, um, both because of just the demands of my time and, and building the business and, and my responsibilities there, but also being a father and having a young, a young child. You know, I got to be home sometimes. I got to you know <laughs> spend time being a father and being a husband as well. So um, it, it, there's more to do than I can do uh, at this point. Um, and again, I think that's a huge change from when I first moved here, you know, five and a half years ago, where I was really actively hunting out the events, and now it's like they just keep coming and coming and coming, and, and so many of them are regular and recurring. So um, there's a lot out there. Now I've kind of shifted to encouraging our folks on our team to get out there as much as possible and go engage in the community, and they have a lot of fun with it. Good. So you all have alluded to this just a little bit, but but being specific about it, looking out five years from now, if we stay on the path we're on, or if we get better at what we're doing, what does this ecosystem look like? How's it gonna be different three, four, five years from now than what it is now? Um, I would say less siloed. Um, um, I, I, and I, I think um, there's a lot of progress um, with that happening. I think there's a lot more companies and organizations who will also be more involved um, you know, it, um, just speaking for us at Starspace, you know, we've been very fortunate with uh, 
companies like Cox actually, you know, being a large part of, of our story. And so I, I think you're going to see a lot of companies um, here in Oklahoma City, whether they're headquartered here or based here or have sort of a presence here, um, really being more part of that, that story here in the city. Um, and I think you'll see a lot more collaboration between the different organizations um, and, 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 and people who are providing services um, as part of the ecosystem. And so I think you'll see a lot of these micro ecosystems converge into a network of a, a bigger ecosystem. And, and I think that's just part of the, the maturity of a city like, like Oklahoma City as, as we become more connected and, 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 and grow in this space. I think, I think that's just a natural way of, of, of things growing and, and becoming uh, a, a larger ecosystem um, where we can all um, work together. Scott, what does your crystal ball look like? Yeah, so I, I think we're, at, like I said, I, we're, I think we're at an interesting point in our in our city's history. Clearly, like I said earlier, I think we've entered the era of the high growth entrepreneur. My question is, in my mind, is will the next five years look like the last five years, and what will it look like? Because we've seen a remarkable number of really good companies in the last five years, and that's coincidentally the amount of time I've been at I2E. But it's, it's a significant change. It's not because I was at I2E. It's just, it's just a significant change in what it was before. And I think that success begets success. And, you know, we talked at lunch. We were talking about, you know, Austin. Well, Austin had Dell Computer, right? And they had this big success. And, and there's other successes around the country in sort of the non- Silicon Valley, East Coast markets, where you see they had a really big success, that then that created all these other successes. So I think what happens is, and we got some pretty nice deals out there right now. That we had we had our first two big exits in the last 12 months. We go look and uh, select us pharmaceuticals, and I think we've got several other pretty nice ones in the pipeline. And I think when those occur. A lot of things happen. I think one is people start taking notice of Oklahoma. So more talent comes to Oklahoma and is more interested in what's going on, but more capital comes to Oklahoma. And then everything feeds off of each other like you've seen. And so, and, and I think it was you said, somebody was, one of, you, one of the guys you were talking to was talking about how Austin, uh, Oklahoma City looks like Austin used to look, what, 20, 15, 15 years yeah. ago. Well, I think Oklahoma City, in a lot better footprint, looks like Austin. If we can get, if we can continue this momentum we've had, and we can get some of the success to getting success, and I think whereas Austin is sort of has all their little physical constraints, Oklahoma City can actually surpass Austin in the long run because of our geographic location, because we don't have sort of the, the center core restraints that Austin does. Um, so I think there's tremendous upside. It's just we've got to be able to sort of replicate what we've seen and have more successes in the future. Yeah, and I, I think, um, I guess building off of that, what's really promising to me about where we are right now is, you know, I, I could start naming off companies, and I think there are probably at least, you know, a half a dozen to a dozen, somewhere in that range, companies that are further along at this point. They have established business models, they're growing, they're building, um, and have a chance to become very significant, very meaningful companies. And so when I think of that, I'm thinking, um, you know, companies that have a shot at becoming, you know, nine-figure revenue type companies um, where they're employing lots of people and they're growing substantially. And I think if we get two, three, four more of those in the local community, that starts to paint that p picture of success beginning success. You have new entrepreneurs who are looking at that saying, hey, it's possible. And, you know, it's not just one or two success stories I can point to. It's a bunch. So I know that it's possible to build here. I'm going to start up a company locally and, and then you get that acceleration in, in the feeder at the, at the bottom of the funnel of new companies being started, some of which are going to make it, some of which aren't. Um, but I th I'm hopeful that we're in a position where we have a number of companies who have a chance to get there uh, and a good chance. And if if nothing else, I mean, we have had you know, probably four or five that I can think of, you know, strong acquisition stories just in the last few years in the community. And I already hear people talking about those all the time. Oh, well, they did it, right? We go looked at it, and iThemes just had a great exit, and Digital Tutors had a good, you know, a good exit. Wow, that's really attractive. I want to build a company in this space also. Uh, so, so I think that momentum keeps building, and I think we're looking at a, at a place where we can say, hey, there are five or six really solid, homegrown, 
companies in the ecosystem. And I'm just thinking about tech. I don't even know that much about biotech and biopharma. There's probably even more companies on that side just based on the longevity of, uh, of investment in the community there. Good. Oh, this is a two-minute warning to the So I'm going to ask them to make one more comment each, and then we're going to open up the forum. So the final thing is, you're talking to members of the business community predominantly. What's your message to them? Uh, what, do you, what does the business community need to do to support entrepreneurship, to support this ecosystem that we want for entrepreneurs? Um, um, I would say support your your local companies. I mean, it's it's you know if if they're a service provider, if they provide a service, um, um, keep it local, right? I mean, uh, I I think if if we can't support our own companies here, why why would people outside the state support our companies? So I I, I think we have to be our our biggest advocates for for our companies, um, telling their stories, um, and and being the biggest advocates. Um, um, for them, um, it, both in and out of the state. Um, but then also, um, you know, it, uh, I, I think our companies here are really good at, at building something out of nothing without a lot of support. But with that said, you know, it, 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 you know, it, it, when it comes to capital investment or anything like that, every every dollar does does go a long way for the companies that are here. And um, you know, I, I think we can all tell the story about the 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 virtues of, of being able to start a company lean, um, but I, I would argue there, there's probably some startup companies here that are kind of beyond lean, they're kind of skin and bones at this point. So uh, so a, a, anything on, on that front would, would be uh, an immense help. And then also just being able to, to be part of that ecosystem, you know, go out. Um, if you haven't been to a user group, go to a user group. If you haven't met some of the startup companies that are, that are um, you know, um, kind of popping up, um, go visit with them, talk with them. I mean, there's Exciting things happening with blockchain in Oklahoma. I mean, I, you know, and with all this talk about cryptocurrency, like that's going on. You know, does anybody even know that that's going on here? Or, or even some of the existing companies, like I mean, Ala Mode is also um, incorporating blockchain into their technology. Like, do do we know about that? Right. I mean, that's typically stuff that you would think of only a San Francisco or a company in Seattle dabbling in. Well, there's established businesses here who are on the cutting edge of that type of stuff. So. Be, be, being our own advocates and being aware of what's going on, I think it's, is kind of the most important thing that we can do. Scott? I would say, similar to what Tommy just said, get involved. You know, be a be a customer. Be be willing to be a beta trial for a new product. Um, be a strategic investor. I mean, there's there's companies out there launching products that could be advantageous to your business. Uh, you know, be a be a mentor. It was interesting. I had, a, I had a conversation a few years ago. I don't think I'll get in trouble for telling this, but Tom Love called me. And he was talking about a mentoring program uh, in Kansas City, and I said, "I said, man, Tom, you'd be a great mentor." And he goes, "Well, I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell those companies." I said, "Well, you know what to tell them what not to do." And he goes, "Yeah, I could do that." <laughs> but I mean, so so everybody has something to offer. I mean, you may not understand, you know, a, a, a platform that's for marketing on Pinterest. But but you know you know a lot about business and you can you can be an advisor and like I said earlier, just show these companies the love. I mean, one of the things I hear uh, about companies that have come here from other places. We got we got Danny came from New York, uh, Dave King from Boston. Um, we got Nate Box. They came from Seattle. It's the community support they get here. It's like, and those markets they're these little bitty fish in this huge massive ocean here they they their people notice them they they wrap their arms around them and they want them to be a success so just get engaged I mean at the end of the day however it is that you you can get engaged okay um, so I think there's there's three things that come to mind for me the first is grow your own business as quickly as you can I'm a strong believer that a rising tide lifts all ships and so Generally, if Oklahoma businesses are growing, even if you're in different sectors, that's going to bring more talent, that's going to bring more capital, that's going to bring more infrastructure, that's going to help everyone in the community, right? So build the highest quality business you can, modernize your business if you need to, figure out succession planning, you know, everyone's in different situations, but, but figure out how to build your own business, I, I think is step one. 
I think step two is look at investing locally, right? And so we talk about areas like Silicon Valley. Well, Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley in part because the people who made their money in Silicon Valley insisted on reinvesting their money in Silicon Valley. And so over time, that created a magnet, created a funnel, entrepreneurs went there, talent went there, more capital went there. And it takes some patience, because I know a lot of times you want to invest now, you want returns now, but building an ecosystem in your own backyard gives you better deal flow in the long term to invest into, and that's good for everyone, and it's good selfishly, you know, over the long term, you know, especially. And I think the third thing is stop thinking in zero-sum terms. Uh, so I've heard a lot about local companies, larger ones especially, who forbid their team members from participating in hackathons or community events or becoming very active. Or if they don't forbid them, they try to very actively discourage them through policy. And I just don't get that at all, honestly. I, I, I think it comes from a mentality of there isn't enough talent to go around, and so I want to protect, I want to keep my jewels secret so no one else can recruit them. But the only way we're all going to grow faster as a community is by attracting a lot more people here. And that takes building up the community, building up the activity levels. Um, and that's how we all win together, right? So I think it's those three things that apply to probably you know, someone coming from any industry, whatever it might be. Great, great, great advice. OK, it's y'all's turn. Uh, we have mics out there. So yeah, raise your hand. Thank you. Um, Comment and a question. My watch told me to stand, so that's why I'm standing. Um, <laughs> and I, I appreciate all the great minds in here. You're melting the ice. Um, so <laughs> one, I would push back and say that I think it's not just Dell that made Austin, but South by Southwest. If we could do something like that here, that would really put us on the map. A uh, question is, could you make us all better brand ambassadors? You mentioned we always say bad, we often say bad stuff about Oklahoma and apologize. Could you all each give me like two things that are great about Oklahoma that we could tell other people? not just in the tech community, but whatever we can say. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll start with some, a per, couple personal examples. Um, so most of my career was in the Valley and in New York before. Uh, it was a, a very protective environment. A lot of, uh, you know, people don't go out of their way to help each other as much as they could. I moved here, I didn't know anyone in town. I started just inviting people to coffee meetings on LinkedIn. People took my meetings and then they offered three more introductions, and, you know, more people that I could go meet. Um, being welcomed like that was a massive jump start for us early on. It's how I got connected to I2E, how we ended up ultimately becoming a portfolio company. And I think just that communal friendliness, that's an asset in and of itself. Um, so I think that's really big. I think the second thing is honestly being able to have more balance to life. Um, I talked to a lot of friends who are still on the coasts and they're getting burned out. And you know, they're tired of the exorbitantly expensive tiny apartment they're living in and the high taxes they're paying and the absurd daycare rates and stuff like that. I mean, a message that you can have a great career, you can do really interesting, meaningful work, you can make good money, and by the way, you can still have time for a life and there's a lot of good stuff to do here. Um, that's actually a big differentiator for a lot of folks. I would say, if I had to choose two things, one would be uh, the cost of doing business, incredibly competitive in Oklahoma. Uh, my guess is you probably pay some of your software engineers about half here, what you'd pay them in New York City. Um, the cost of energy, the cost of real estate. I mean, if you, compared to either coast, I mean, we're, it's an amazingly good deal from a business standpoint, you could build a lot of businesses just around leveraging the cost savings that you would get if you'd relocate those businesses from either coast to Oklahoma. And the second one is kind of hits on the other thing Danny said, is the quality of life. I mean, it's so much different in Oklahoma. Um, it, it, it's, it, it feels smaller. Uh, you don't spend as much time in your car driving back and forth to work every day. Uh, there's much more of a, of a sense of community here. And it's just, it, it's, a, it's a different, and unless you've lived in one of the coasts, it's just a different lifestyle um, here that, that a lot of people find is a great place to, to live and in particular raise a family. Um, I, I would say Oklahoma City is, is um, and, it, and this is what I tell people outside of the state, is that it's this great sandbox where 
um, you have opportunities to kind of create your own success and wealth that you're not afforded in any other city, I believe. And so a, a, a story I, I often tell, so a, a friend of mine, Jonathan Stranger, uh, um, um, he's a chef here, he's done a number of things. You know, he, he will never get a Michelin star um, being here in Oklahoma. Um, and, and he's always sort of been down on himself because of that. And, and he didn't really choose Oklahoma City. Like, his wife sort of made that choice for him. So that's why he's here. Um, but then I point out to him, you know, yeah, you, you'll never get that Michelin star, but you, you, you had a hand in creating h and Eighth, which became one of the world's largest food truck festivals. Um, you served a, a six-course meal on a Ferris wheel in, in Willard Park. You know, I, and, and he's been successful in, in opening, um, you know, six restaurants now. Um, and, and he's doing a collaboration with um, Chef Fabio Viviani from the Food Network on creating a, an Italian restaurant that's going to be here in Oklahoma City. Um, it's one of the few um, restaurants that Fabio Viviani is, has opened under his name and his brand. And the next one is here. It's, it's, it's going to open here. And so, yeah, he won't get his Michelin star. but. With that limitation and, and, and the sandbox that Oklahoma City provides him, he's been able to do so much more. I mean, you know, he, he won't be able to do something, you know, he's not going to be able to do an h and in New York City. They're probably already saturated with that, and, and there's, you know, there's probably different rules behind that. You know, he probably wouldn't be able to serve an, a six-course meal in a French-themed sort of event uh, for folks riding on a, on, on a Ferris wheel, right? And so I think, like, I, I tell that story because I think, the metrics for success in Oklahoma City, although it may not align with, with the metrics that, that you might be judged for in, in San Francisco or New York, but I think you can kind of make up your own rules and, and, and be successful here in, in far greater ways than, than kind of the existing metrics that you might be aware of now you know, in, in other cities. And so I think that sandbox mentality, you know, you know, appealing to the, the crafters and the makers of the world who, who want to mold something out of nothing. I think, I think that's really important for Oklahoma City, but I think that's also what's going to help grow and drive um, Oklahoma City to becoming not just the next Austin, but I think the next better than Austin in, in 20 years. So to your question, I'm not on the panel, but I do have a microphone and I'm with the Chamber of Commerce. So <laughs> <laughs> I have an opinion. Uh, two things, uh, and in more, it's, it's destroying false myths. Uh, and they've been talked about a little bit, but you know, we still hear, oh, Oklahoma City's all about oil and gas. And that's, if you're not in oil and gas, there's no place for you. Well, the facts are less than 3% of the employment in the metropolitan area is oil and gas. Uh, most people think it's 20 or 30%. It's less than 3%. More than double those numbers are the aviation and aerospace industry the uh, bioscience industry, and the fastest growing industry is the hospitality industry. So everybody thinks we're nothing but oil and gas, and if you're not a petroleum engineer, there's no reason for you to be in Oklahoma City. Uh, couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, plus, even the oil and gas uh, industries don't just hire petroleum engineers. Uh, when you look at what the skills are in that industry, they're very diverse, uh, like these guys have been talking about. And then the second thing that's already been talked about is college grads. The, the statistics are that if you're from Oklahoma and you graduate from an Oklahoma university, over 90% of you will stay here. You will not leave. And if you're from out of state and you graduate here, over 50% of you will stay here. So this whole myth about we educate everybody and they all go, that's not true at all. You can look at the facts and the statistics. The college students are smarter than you think they are. They are staying where there is opportunity, and there's opportunity here. So they're not fleeing. And in taking that another step, we have net positive in migration from every surrounding state, including Texas, which means more Texans move to Oklahoma than Oklahomans move to Texas. Most people will tell you, oh, that's not what I think, but the numbers are what's correct and what's factual. But people spread those myths. And we begin, you know, being our own problem instead of being our own asset. So, uh, we're at the witching hour. So uh, I want to thank the panelists. Again, help me thank them for their participation today.
once again, I want to thank our signature sponsor, Cox uh, Business, and our series corporate sponsors, ADG and Guernsey. At next month's forum on March the 21st, uh, we're going to be talking about the new tax reform law and how it impacts small and medium businesses. Uh, and we want you to hear that from the experts. So register online. We'll see you March 21st right here in the same room. Thank all of you for being here today. We're adjourned. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.